بركاته أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت إن شئت تجعل الحزن سهلا اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من أن نشرك بك شيئا نعلمه ونستغفرك لما لا نعلمه ثم أما بعد As we mentioned before, the book uh, of Ihya Alum al-Din is divided into four quarters. The first one, if you remember, uh, the quarter of acts of worship, al-ibadat. And the second quarter is Rubba al-adat, the routinely daily, daily life activities. Um, and uh, the third one is Rubba al-muhlikat, the acts of tradition or destruction. And the final quarter is called the Rubba al munjiyat the acts of um, uh, salvation or um, uh, the acts of uh, najah, which means safety, ways of safety. So um, today, inshallah, we uh, decided just to uh, jump from the first Rubba, which we talked about, the book of knowledge. And inshallah, today we'll start the Rubba al muhlikat and then followed by al munjiyat This is the perhaps the, uh, the core of the book of Imam al-Ghazali. And this is also related to what he mentioned in, in uh, the book of knowledge and when he talked about the qalb and the heart and this is the most uh, uh, important part of the body. And he started Rubh uh, al-Muhlikat, the third quarter, al-Muhlikat, the acts of tradition, with talk by talking about the marvels of the heart, or ajaib al-qalb, call it ajaib al-qalb. This qalb is so um, uh, wonderful and so complex. Um, and he also argued that this is the part of human that um, has been honored by being able to know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what gives honor to us as humans. It's not our body, it's not our shape. It is our heart. He also has a different book called The, um, uh, the Chemistry of Happiness. Uh, when he talked about the heart, and this is the ultimate happiness comes from knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, here in, in, in the marvels of the heart, he um, talks about um, the heart that, that walks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah talks to the heart, Allah addresses the heart, and it is the heart that um, uh, can receive the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all limbs and organs are servants to this heart um, the heart is the one that obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reality and this obedience of the heart is reflected on the, um, uh, the limbs of, of, of the body through the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so in other words it is the heart that receives the message understand the message and follow the message the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, but he made also a, a very important uh, point, uh, point that I want really to talk about. Uh, when he said that in order to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you must know yourself. And that's a very critical point uh, in, in, in Imam Ghazali's philosophy. That you cannot know anything else unless you know yourself. And to know yourself, you need to know your heart. Which is basically who, who you are. So to know Allah, you need to know your heart first and the attributes of this heart and the qualities of the heart and the relationship between the heart and the body. This is uh, something that uh, he started uh, uh, with. So inshallah, we'll try to uh, summarize what Imam al-Ghazali says. He basically says that transfer, transform man from um, uh, the baseness into uh, the purity and the angelic level, um, this goes only through increasing his knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We share with animals so many things, right? But we're not animals, we're not angels, we are in between. So people will either go down as falasafilin to the level of animals, or they try to go up to the level of angels, right? 
So only through knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we can attain this level or high ranks, not the ranks of animals. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, that many people live the li life of animals. In fact, the majority of people, they live the life of animals. They enjoy and eat like animals. And they don't understand the purpose of their presence. They are not trying or exerting any effort to go higher in ranks. So how to do that? He said you need to know yourself. And when you know yourself, then you can know Allah. And when you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is when you can attain the high level of happiness. This is the ultimate goal for, for, for anybody. If you ask someone, want, what do you want to do? I want this, why? Because I want this, why? Because the last thing will be, because I want to be happy. Right? And Islam recognizes this fact. People want to be happy. Everyone of us, everyone, Muslim, non-Muslim, believers, non-believers, everyone is searching for this happiness. So Imam al-Ghazali is trying to shed some light on this, on this fact and how to reach real happiness. Uh, it's only through know, knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, 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 and this is when you can attain happiness. He said it's also important to realize that every one of us uh, has two parts. One is the body and the other is the heart or the spiritual heart. He talks about the spiritual heart. He said first you need to recognize the fact that you are a body and a heart. Or these two things are not the same. And he will talk about the relationship between them uh, uh, later. But he said that you must understand that you have a heart. And this heart is the part of you that recognizes things, understands things. Allah talks to and Allah expects him to respond, to, to respond. And the heart works to seek the happiness through knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he talked about the body and the heart and he gave this analogy he said the, the body is like a kingdom right the body is a kingdom he said that limbs and organs are the workers people work in this um, kingdom and appetite desires like tax collectors and anger is the police in this kingdom. Then he talked about intelligence as that chief minister in this kingdom and the heart is the king. Is this, is this clear? Okay, this kingdom, you have people, workers, these are the organs and the limbs, and then you have the tax collector, which is the appetite, and you have the police, which is anger, and then you have the intellect, which is the chief minister. And then you have the heart. Now, in the case when the best advisor of the king is, the in, is, is intelligence, and appetite and anger are under control, that would be great, right? That would be the best case scenario. We have a king and you have the best advisor is in intellect or the wise man okay and appetite and police are under control then the limbs and the organs will be fine and the kingdom will be intact okay but if intelligent intelligence is imprisoned by the police and appetite Police and appetite are so powerful, so strong, and they don't like intellect. They always have conflict with intellect. And they manage to imprison intellect. In other words, intellect has no influence on the king. What will happen then to this kingdom? The heart will be corrupt, of course, because he gets advice only from anger, corrupt police, and corrupt appetite or desires. Right? And this is exactly what happens to many people. They are controlled. Their heart is a weak king, always controlled by his anger and by his appetite. And the intellect is imprisoned. All right? And that's why people live the life of animals. And that's why you can see a lot of conflict. Because anger refers to the, the, the desire of you know, um, 
beating others and taking other people's properties and envy and hatred. It's because of that, because of, of this anger responsible for, for, for all these things and translate into action. It's like, like corrupt police people. You know what, what they do, right? They abuse the power they have. And the appetite, of course, is that desire that, that always uh, never come to an end, it never satisfied. And where is the intellect that balance the power of appetite and anger? It's, it's missing. So the, the entire thing is, is messed up. You can see the imbalance. And that's why people get angry. People have conflicts with each other, individuals, families, tribes, and countries, because they want to get more. They are envious. You have so much oil, and I don't. I have very so I want to take your oil, so I go and invade your country and kill your people and take the oil. Right? Um, that that is why there are plenty of conflicts. Right? And because of of the power of appetite, people are worshiping their desires. They, 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 they worship their enjoyment, right? Uh, eating and sleeping and copulating and so on and so forth. They find their happiness in these things. They find their happiness in fulfilling the desire of anger and abusing other people. Um, but they don't find the ultimate happiness, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the heart is corrupt, right? So, um, <coughs> you can tell that there's always contact, co uh, uh, constant uh, spiritual struggle between, between intellect and appetite and anger. So, whoever is closer, or have more control in the heart, then, then this determines what kind of person you are talking to. As we mentioned before, Imam Azali mentioned that some people, they look like humans, but they're not humans. Their spirit, their, their attitude is the attitude of, 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 of beasts who would do whatever it takes to hurt other people, to take their rights. And the world is full of these people now. And m many of them are presidents and kings, unfortunately. Right? So um, this constant struggle between intellect Appetite and anger is the process of what we call it mujahada. You have, you have always mujahada. You have to push, you have to keep appetite and anger under control. Um, then um, he talked about um, the relationship between the body and the heart when he said that the appetite and anger were made or created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to. Uh, nourish the body and protect the body. You have to get angry sometimes. Anger is not always bad. There's a good anger and bad anger. A good anger that Allah created us to be angry sometimes. When your family is attacked, then you have to get angry, right? To protect yourself. Even animals, you know, could be peaceful, but sometimes they get very angry. When you attack any animals, uh, youngsters, then the mother or the father will go and attack you. Or this is natural um, uh, uh, instinct that help us to protect ourselves. So anger is needed. It's like police. You have to have police. You have to have an army, right, to protect yourself. Because when someone tries to come and attack you, then you have to get angry and use this anger to, fi to fight back, right? So this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this instinct to, to, to protect us, and the appetite is very important. We have to desire eating and drinking and have, having intimate relations in order to work and to nurture the body. We have to have a strong body and good body. And the sins are the in intelligence collector, as we mentioned last time. All these senses, they collect information, sama and basar, hearing and seeing and, and, and tasting and, and, and sensing things are important because they are collecting intelligence. And um, the intelligent is the uh, lamp of the heart that gives life to the heart. The more intelligent, the more light you have in the heart. And the heart is created to witness the beauty of the divine. 
Okay, so now, now we can see this balance. If everything goes right with a right balance, then you will have the appetite needed to nurture your body. You, have the, you, need, you need to have anger because sometimes you have to get angry to protect your body. Someone wants to attack you. Um, and, um, uh, and, and the senses are collecting information. And this information or intelligence is the light of the heart. And the heart is created to witness the beauty of the divine uh, uh, presence. Allah nuru samawati wal You can understand this ayat in this context. Allah nuru samawati wal ard. Matal nurihi, the ayat. So the light, the, the 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 heart is the place that receives the light of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And in the hadith, ma wasi'ani ardi wa la samai, walakin wasi'ani qalb abdul mumin. Narrated that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that my heaven and earth cannot you know, contain me, but the heart of, of the believers can, not physically, of course. So, the heart of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, so the heart of, of a human can receive the, or get exposed to the knowledge uh, or the beauty of the divine presence. It, it, this point clear so far. So He's taught also about the quality from different perspectives about the quality um, of the heart. He just mentioned the, the things that we mentioned before, but in different analogy. He said, in every heart, there is something similar to the khanzir and the dog and shaitan and a wise man. These four things coexist together in the, in, 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 in the heart, can coexist together. Khanzir refers to the appetite or the desire. You know, always need more, want more, find ha happiness in desires, fulfilling desires. Right? And a dog is referring to the anger. If not controlled, this can go and bite people. Right? Wild animals, uh, dogs do that. And the shaitan is there, and what he's doing is is trying to stimulate the khanzir and the dog always wants them to be active all the time. This is his job. And the fourth is the wise man, the angelic heart. So these four qualities of the heart can coexist. But of course for the, the uh, person to gain the happiness, this angelic um, part of the heart must control the other three, right? Must control the other three. Otherwise, if anger or appetite or, or um, uh, shaitan is in control, then we will be, be in trouble. Um, so this angelic um, attribute of the heart must master the other quality. All these qualities, that's why the nafs, as Imam Ghazali will talk about, could be nafs lawama or nafs ammara or nafs mutma'inna. It depends on w where are you in these things. If someone's heart is controlled by his khanzir and his dog and shaitan, then you, you can tell that this person is not a human. He is a beast in the form of a man. And the job of the believers, Islam came to purify our hearts, to help us control the, these three um, qualities of the heart. Um, and you can, you can see that uh, the first part or the khanzir or the shahwa uh, uh, attitude find its happiness in, uh, in rage and destruction. This is what's created for. And uh, the second one was khanzir in particular to talk about this tile uh, nature or quality of the heart to find happiness in eating and sleeping and copulating and so on. And that's it. And the third one, he called it that uh, demonic or evil um, uh, attribute that, um, that always uh, focus on evil and, and deceiving uh, and ritual and so on. And the angelic one is the last one. So these are the four attributes of the heart. For the believers, they must master, or the angelic part or quality must master the other three. And the nobility of the heart is 
um, what elevates humans above the rank of beasts. Because animals, again, they, they do almost other, all other things. Or they have anger by nature. They know what they are looking for and what they are afraid of. And they know how to defend themselves, and run away from any danger, right? Uh, they know how to reproduce naturally. Nobody teach them that. It's part of their nature. They fulfill desires, and by fulfilling these desires, they stay uh, alive, right? They know that. When a deer sees a lion for the first time, she, it will run away, right? Nobody taught her this, but it's part of, of, of uh, nature. When we see a snake, we run away because we want to protect ourselves. By nature, we want to stay alive. We want to run away from anything that will harm us, right? So, so, um, um, so the nobility of the heart, when the heart is pure and clean and, and controlled, this is what elevates humans to uh, the rank uh, uh, of angels. So um, then he talked about the four terminology that we discussed last time, uh, nafs, ruh, aql, and qalb. And Imam al-Ghazali said that many people, they, they, they mix the, 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 or the meanings of these, they use them interchangeably. And he here gave some uh, distinction between, between them um, as you will see now. Mm. Well, he said so many things here, but he said about these four terminology. He started by talking about the qalb. And he said this, this, there are two meanings the word qalb. One is the organ that we know, this pump. Um, and he said, this is not what's meant when the Quran says qalb. However, he said there is a relationship between the qalb, that the organ, and the qalb that he uh, called it latifa rabbaniya ruhiya. It says a, a secret, a divine secret. Nobody knows exactly what it is. Something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in the body that makes us who we are. And this part, as uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, if it's sound, um, then the entire body will be sound, and if corrupt, the entire body will be corrupt. So two meanings, the organ and the secret. And the ruh, he also talked about the ruh, um, they are talking about two things. Um, the first meaning, he said that it is, it is what gives us a life. And the second meaning is al-latifa, al-alima, al-mudrika, the part that knows and um, uh, has the meaning of also of, of the heart. And then he talked about the nafs, and he said the nafs are, have also two meanings. One is the nafs that's always used uh, uh, or, or mentioned as, as corrupt nafs. Nasullah fa ansahum and fusahum. In the other ayat uh, or the hadith, uh, the Prophet said that your worst enemy is your nafs. So this is the, the, the first meaning of an nafs but the second one is that again this secret, this subtle thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed in us. And sometimes it is good, nafs al-lawama, and sometimes it's even better, nafs al-mutma'inna, and sometimes it's very bad, that's the nafs al-ammara, the suit. Um, it depends on how we are treating it. And the final one, which are al-aql, when he also said that there are different meanings. One, it could be uh, knowing things, the ability of knowing things, and a sifa, that's also in the heart. Or I the word knowledge could also mean that the place where the knowledge is in. In other words, he said the scholar. If you look at a scholar, he is a scholar, a, a human, and knowledge is something added to him, right? They're not the same. They are not the same. If, God forbid, this scholar got Alzheimer and he forget everything, then knowledge is taken away from him. So he's not a scholar anymore. But the, the being of the person is, is still there, okay? So he said, similarly, when we say al-aql, we are referring either to the place in which knowledge comes, or it's referred to the knowledge itself. 
Um, that's why he referred to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ who said that the first thing Allah has created is al-aql. Then Allah told him, come, he came, he go, he goes. So he said it's impossible to imagine this hadith in this, in this context. The hadith, it refers to the, the knowledge itself, but rather it's talking to the place that received the knowledge. So in other words, he refers all these uh, uh, meanings, nafs, aql, ruh, and qalb, into who we are. The part of us that, um, that created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to comprehend, to receive the message, to be able to comprehend the message, and to follow the message and make decisions. Then he talked briefly about, um, um, I'll end with this inshallah. Uh, he said the junood, the junood of al-aql. Junood, the word junood is refers to, to literal means soldiers. But he means here the junood, the tools of al-qalb. He said there are three. One is known, known as al-irada, al-irada, the will. The second is al-qudra, the ability. And the third is al-ilm, knowledge and idrak. The first one, which is al-irada, he says there are two kinds. One is something that brings good, and the other one pushes away harmful things. So he said the appetite job is to bring good, so that you go and eat and get married and so on. And anger is to push away any danger. Right? This is the irada, the will. The second one is al-qudra and the qudra is what motivates the limbs and the organs to achieve these things so and and um, and he called al-qudra the ability to do because you, you may have a will but you don't have a qudra you want to get married but you cannot get married right you want but you can't it happens all the time so until you have the irada and qudra together then you can do something and the third one um, is talking about the senses, and uh, again, these senses that what gives us knowledge. So the heart is using these three things: irada, the will, the power, and the intellect. And um, then he um, uh, talked about how these three things, again, are servants; they are tools that the heart uses um, uh, and, or, and and need very much to gain knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I just want to end by, by this, uh, that, that, that Imam al-Ghazali says that if, if the heart is busy all the time satisfying his desire, and, and, and whether it's anger or appetite, um, and then, and, 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 and I, the ibadat, the organs, the, the body is not actually is not also obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then uh, it's very difficult to, to, to gain the knowledge of Allah and therefore it's very difficult to attain any kind of happiness. What we do in, with our body reflects what's in our heart. So when we come to the masjid, pray tahajjud and, and pray in time and in Ramadan, we come for taraweeh, this reflects what's in, the, in our heart. And this can be seen in our body. And subhanAllah, you can really see the light in the faces of the people in time of Hajj or Umrah or Ramadan, you can see that the faces are different. Um, I have the privilege of giving Eid khutbah, so I, when I sit and see like hundreds of faces, they are different. Faces are different. I can see the faces of the people are different. Really, I don't know if you can notice this. But again, w w it's, it's like it's like you know a, a bottle of, of water and you fill it to the end. So this will start spilling out, right? Um, and similarly, when people um, disobey Allah so and commit sins all the time, and their heart is corrupt, this is also shown in their, in their body and in their, in their behavior, how they behave and how they do things. And they're so far away from Allah, and therefore, whatever happiness they have is, not, is, is a fake happiness. And this explains why so many people are wealthy and healthy and, and they are doing whatever they want. They have absolute freedom to do everything, but they are not happy. 
just go and survey ask people that you think are living in beautiful homes and nice cars and good jobs titles but they're not happy and people are seeking happiness and they are trying to find happiness but sometimes they're not really happy why they're not happy because they are trying to satisfy the appetite and the anger. And intelligence is in prison. They are far from Allah. So for the believers, they will not be really happy uh, as long as they are far away from Allah. We have to start this journey. We have to work on our heart. That's why he said, if you don't know your heart, you will not know yourself. If you don't know yourself, you will not know Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you don't know Allah, you will never be happy. The real happiness is the knowledge of Allah. You cannot gain this knowledge of Allah until you know yourself. And I hope we shed some light today about ourselves and our heart and how things work. And um, we must pay attention to our, this is the, the most valuable part of us. We cannot afford to let this heart be controlled by appetite and by anger and not by intelligence and not by the light of the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will stop here, inshallah, and if you have any comments or questions, we are happy to answer them. <coughs> this is a question? Oh, okay. All right. Any comments or questions? about Imam Ghazali's note. <coughs> yeah, this is uh, the dua we talked about last time. Insha'Allah, Jazakumullah khair. And uh, we have our brother here. Uh, may Allah bless him. He brought us a uh, dua in Arabic. And translation in English and uh, the transliteration which I don't recommend but uh, it's there um, this is the Jawami uh, Abdu'a as Rasulullah was teaching Aisha radiallahu anha who said alaykum bi Jawami Abdu'a make this comprehensive Dua and what, sh what should I say she asked and he said say this and this is um, uh, beautiful Dua so can we distribute this okay can help us with this Jazakumullah khair and uh, maybe you can also give the sisters uh, some of this for the sisters Jazakumullah khair and Barakallah feek Jazakumullah khair yes Hassan al-Basri uh, is um, one of the tabi'een, the great tabi'een. He's a scholar and a faqih and, and also a scholar of the heart. Ulum um, al-Tazkiyah. Uh, he's a abid, a very good worshiper. And uh, what's also unique about him is that he saw some of the Sahaba, maybe one or two or three, Anas al-Dumalik is one of them. Um, and during his time, there was uh, also political uh, upheaval. And he was known as a person who says the truth, no matter what. He's invited by uh, political authorities, and, and he was Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Thaqafi was very tough and very um, aggressive. But uh, Hassan al-Basri used to, to, to say the truth, no matter what. And he was ready to be killed, but Allah protected him so um, people are seeking knowledge tafsir hadith fiqh but in addition to this he was also a scholar of tazkiyah he always um, he has a lot of good beautiful quote uh, 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 co good quoting about Imam Hassan and, and he has the person has the wisdom has the wisdom yeah. so when he speaks he gives you 
you know, a few words and give that carries so much meaning. So um, um, I don't remember right now uh, his contribution, but there are a lot of sayings. Uh, for example, he says, "Son of Adam, oh son of Adam, you are nothing but few days, right? And when a day passes by, part of you is gone, right? And when part is gone, eventually the whole will be gone. Every day is a step you take to your grave, right? So you have to." take advantage of every day because the day that passes will never come back. So he's the kind of person who, who, who gives these beautiful meanings in, in few words and easy to memorize. Um, and people collected actually some of his speech and khutbas and, 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 and so on. So, but he was a great man. Um, he was asked one day that uh, people talk so much about you and your ibadah and your taqwa and your iman because he comes and teach in Basra and um, yeah, yeah, hundreds of people come and listen to his speech and things, and, and people talk very highly about him. So his students they to told him that you know people are talking so much about this. I mean, for Sufi people, they should hide their 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 good deeds. And um, um, when people talk so much about someone, that's that's that that can hurt actually the person. Because you can feel, you know, I'm better than everybody else. Um, so when they when they told him about this, this is some sort of contradiction they saw that, that. and he said, Alhamdulillah, الذي أظهر الحسن القبيح. Praise be to Allah, who made my good deeds visible, and He hid my bad deeds. So it's 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 from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and nobody can can do anything about it. Um, so um, he, Imam Al Ghazali, also quoted him so many times in in, in, in his work. In in, in the book of Fiqh, uh, they also mention his opinion. Uh, Imam Al Hasan Basri says it's okay to do this, and they name him as one of the great authority in Fiqh and Hadith also. Something called Marasil al Hassan. Some scholars said that it's, it's acceptable, some others said not acceptable. Because Al Hamam al Hassan, when the hadith comes from many Sahaba, because he's number two, the narration he comes, comes from, he did not see many Sahaba, but he saw some. So if he got the hadith from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and, and other narration, Anas ibn Malik, another narration from Abdullah ibn Umar, he does not say the name of the Sahab. He said the Prophet وسلم, said so and so. He did not see the Prophet. And there must be someone between him and the Prophet. And he does not mention him. Sometimes he does not mention the name because it comes from so many Sahaba, so to him, it does not make a big difference. To him, hadith is authentic. So this is called Marasil al Hassan. Mursal, when the Sahaba is not mentioned. The Tabi'i said, the Prophet said, without mentioning the link between the Tabi'i and the Sahaba, because it must be someone. Sometimes two. One Sahabi tells another Sahabi, and then the Sahabi goes to the Tabi'i. But he was thiqa, he was a trustworthy person. When he narrates hadith, people take it from him because he has a sharp mind and he is trustworthy. In the book of Tazkiyah, you'll find his sayings, his words. His All right, so inshallah next week we'll, okay, go ahead.
Well, uh, right. Uh, Imam al Ghazali actually, when he talks about knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the book of Aqidah, when he talks about Aqidah, he said that young kids, they are taught by their parents, the masajid and madrasas, that about Allah and His Messenger and the Quran, and they imitate in Aqidah. And he said that's okay, because in this stage they are not required to know the depth of the presence of the divine and all, all these kind of things. And as they grow up, this knowledge is also um, uh, is a component, um, an important component of his growth, because he also needs some sort of discipline. And he receives this discipline from the people are taking care of him parents, school, and so on. So they do ibadah, and they fast in Ramadan when they are still young children, right? So they, are, they have the faith, uh, the belief, the basic belief, and then they have the good deeds. And these two things, he said, they grow as this person grows. And he goes from imitating an aqidah into rationalizing and understanding, a better understanding of aqidah. So it's not anymore an imitation. It starts with imitation, which is okay. It happens. This is how it should happen. And then, like kids, memorize Quran. They memorize the entire Quran without understanding anything. As they grow up, they love the Quran, they review the Quran, they memorize the Quran, and then they start gradually understand. And they can go as far as they can go when it comes to understanding. It can be Qurtubi or Tabari, right? Or it can be like an average Muslim knowledge. Read the Quran and have basic understanding or he can be a scholar similarly when it comes to 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 adab al nafs he gets the basics and then as he grows he goes through the discipline and nurture this iman with ibadah and ta'am fasting praying and so on and so forth until he attains the age that allows him to have a better and in, in depth understanding of iman and ibadat and so on uh, then he can fly on his own. And in this case, he said that, that his iman will be very strong and powerful because he got it from young age, grows with him, accompanied with ibadah and ta'a, and this ibadah and ta'a strengthen the heart, and the heart, when the heart is strong, it will help also in ibadah. So this is like a circle. The heart affects the body. So if the heart is sound, then the body will pray and fast and give sadaqah easily. And the more you do the, of uh, these good deeds, the more the heart will be stronger in Iman. So, and again, it's a, the body and the heart going together. The leader is the king of the heart, but the body is also um, is, is working and, and, and acting upon this. So, um, um, going back to the, the, the point of this, the spirit and nafs and aql, eventually Imam Ghazali, it's clear uh, to me in, in his book that, that all these things have the same meaning. Um, that they are all the part of us that understands, that is responsible, we hold accountable, make decision, and so on. And this is the, the part that, uh, that, that must be taken care of. Uh, but again, that's why it's very important to discipline youth, to make them you know, uh, pray in, in young age, uh, six or seven years old, right? And the girls wear hijab before they attain the age of puberty. And uh, kids also fast when they are young. This is the sunnah to train the kids. To, uh, so the iman and the amal salih they grow together. And then, and as they grow, they can read more and understand more and develop their own meaning. And keep in mind, Imam Ghazali went through this doubt himself when he questioned, "Why am I Muslim?" Right? He went through this, and he took time out. We mentioned this before, and he decided to to. Be a rational believer, not only a passionate believer. It's not just about love. It's about doing something everybody's doing. But he wants to ensure that he worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based off of his personal conviction, not, not someone else, imitating someone else. So he went through this process. Um, and he eventually reached to this conclusion that it's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that you can get love and mercy and peace and happiness from. You cannot get these things from anywhere else. You cannot get from anywhere else. Because every enjoyment, even halal enjoyment, even halal enjoyment, um, 
every halal enjoyment comes with some price. It's an analogy. If you enjoy something, there's a price for it. There's some pain, there's some suffering. Right? The sexual desire, you have to get married, you have to be responsible. You have to have kids, then you have to feed them, take care of them, and wife will be pregnant, and you have to take care of them and work hard. To it's, it's difficult. I mean, so you get some enjoyment, and you get a lot of pain <laughs> in this dunya. Right? Um, food, you know, you li everybody likes to eat. So we eat, but then you get a lot of problems, you know, diarrhea or bloating, and um, you know, you get high cholesterol, extra fat, you get a, a heart problem, and so on. So food is important, but when we use it in an excessive way, it, 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 it becomes harmful. That's why even the halal enjoyment must be moderate. Because we're not living in paradise. Only in paradise, there's only enjoyment and there's no pain. In this life, every happiness, every enjoyment is, ac is accompanied by pain. Even the halal ones. Even the halal ones. So, so we, ha we have to be careful. And this is dunya. I mean, it's, it's very imperfect life. It's very imperfect. It's very short. Accompanied with ha happiness is not absolute. It's not perfect. It's not pure happiness. The real happiness that's pure and useful in this life, in the life after, is no knowledge of Allah. This is the basic, the, the, the central argument or, or philosophy of Imam al-Ghazali. To do this, then you need to know about Allah. To know Allah, then you need to know yourself. Knowing yourself will help you know Allah, and then this will help you attain happiness. Okay. Yes. context he's talking about happiness the ultimate happiness is to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala people talk about knowing yourself to develop passion to be passionate about something and then you can be something so uh, again they're talking from dunya perspective if you want to be a, an, a, an athlete if you want to be a champion if you want to be the best engineer in the world right you need to know yourself find out what are the things they are good at and then be passionate in, in achieving it. And this is dunya. He's talking about dunya. Right? But Imam Ghazali is saying it to a very high level. He said, yeah, this dunya is, is, is you know, is, is uh, a necessary stage to attain the ultimate life in the akhirah. So, yeah, the same concept applies to dunya and akhirah. If you want to be the king of this world and you became the king of this world, you're not going to be happy still. Because those who are kings, and, and they are, they're also have their own suffering. They win the election, but they work like you know, crazy. They're not really enjoying their life. So, knowing yourself is important, and it depends on your, in your, in your priority. What are your priorities? You want to be good in this dunya? Yes, there's nothing wrong with that. To be the best physician or the best businessman, to grow your business, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, but but this should not be the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to know about Allah and this will take you to happiness. I don't know if, if you can see the similarity. Yes, I exactly. So if you apply Imam al Ghazali to this, it's the same thing. The passion is to be happy in this dunya and the akhirah. If this is your passion, then you have to work hard to achieve this. You need to know yourself to achieve your goal. الله تعالى عارف سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت استغفر لك وتوب إليك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم العصر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصلوا بالحق وتواصلوا بالصبر سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين الحمد لله رب